All right, good morning, church family. If you've got a Bible nearby, I want you to go ahead and meet me in Romans 12. Uh, Feel free to use the table of contents if you need to locate where that is in the New Testament. And whether you're here in the room or tuning in online, or maybe you're here today visiting us for part of the long holiday weekend, I wanna say welcome. My name's Nate Reed. I'm one of the pastors here at Tyson's, and I am so excited to dive into the word with you here this morning. Uh, Before I do that, I do want to mention, if you missed last Sunday, I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to David's message. We shared last week, we had a plan and we completely pivoted as we became aware of some of the major needs within the foster system here in our counties. And we took some time as a church family to press into God's word and to call each other to respond to that need. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that, I really wanna encourage you to give that a listen and also let you know that there is still time to respond to that need. Uh, you can head over to mclaimbible.org slash foster where we've got tons of resources. You can find the sermon, uh, links to resources here in our county. And then next Sunday, September 8th, after both of our services here at Tyson's and in the Smith Center, we're gonna have an interest meeting where you'll be able to hear from representatives from our county, some of the partners that we talked about last week to hear how, even if it's just how to pray more for some of these needs, how you can be involved in responding to that crisis in our city. So even if, when you filled out that form last week, if you just checked, I wanna know how to pray, I would encourage you, still come to that interest meeting so that you can learn more. And if you are still kind of praying over the last week, like, God, what is my role? Come to that interest meeting, and as you hear about some of the needs and opportunities, the Lord might clarify some of that calling for you, so I wanna make sure you don't miss that. That is next Sunday after both of our services in the Smith Center. Now, before we get to our passage today, I want to ask you a question. Has there ever been a time when you learned something about something familiar and thought, how did I not know it did that? I heard yes right up front, like, I'm sure that's happened to many of us. That actually happened to my kids not long ago when they realized that when they go to Chick-fil-A, they can exchange the toy in their kid's meal for ice cream for free. Some of you are like, what? <laughs> Sorry, parents, that may have just ruined your, your family dinner time at Chick-fil-A now. Yes, you can do that. And that's changed their lives and it's impacted us every time they get ice cream for the next many hours after that. This actually happened to me also, this, this this past week I was in our basement and I saw, guys, I saw this massive spider and I was convinced it was a brown recluse. Like I was freaking out. And I called to my wife and I said, Rachel, you gotta see this spider. And she said, hey, did you know you can take out your iPhone, take a picture of it and the phone will identify what kind of a bug it is. I was like, I didn't know that. So I took out my phone, took a picture of the, of the spider And it told me it was actually a wolf spider instead of a brown recluse. So not as bad, not poisonous, but equally as terrifying. I'm telling you, it was huge. It was huge. But it was helpful. Some of you need to discover in your email client the archive button. I know you're proud of having over 130,000 emails in your inbox but folks, there is a better way. You wonder why you're stressed out during the week, and you say, I have a system. I don't care what your system is. If you have 130,000 emails in your inbox, things are falling through the cracks. Archive those things. You can still hold on to them, but you just don't have to see them all in that one spot, right? Yes, some of you aren't convinced. Try it later this week. You'll learn. The same thing actually happens with tools in the construction world quite a bit. I've mentioned this before, but when I was in college, I worked on a team that helped build and frame out houses, and I learned so much about tools that I didn't know when I first started working in that job. I loved it, I enjoyed it. I didn't have one of those cool tool belts yet, but one of the tools that I learned how to use when we were there was this guy. Something you use quite often when you're working on a house. It's an adhesive or a caulking gun for uh, like things like liquid nail or silicone. Uh, you, you all familiar with these? Yeah. So when you're building a house, when you're using things like this, there's, you use this either a lot or it sits around and then the top kind of hardens up and then you don't really know how to use it again. And because I didn't have a lot of experience, every time I'd need a new, new tube of something like this, I would have to run back down, get a utility knife, and cut off the top, and then come back, and then I'd need another one, I'd have to go back and do it again. 
And it was really starting to bug the other guys that I was working with. And one of the other guys who'd been working in the, in the business for a while, he said, Nate, look at the handle of the caulking gun. So I looked at it and he said, see that little hole right there? It's like, yeah. He goes, put the tip in there. It cuts it right off. <laughs> I said, I wish I would have known that. Now this same guy, I would keep bugging. I would say, I need a nail to kind of poke the top of this. It, it's, it's hardened up. He said, look at the front of the gun. And I said, oh. I said, what's that for? And he goes, look, you can open it up that way. I didn't know that. I wish I had known that. If I had known that, it would have saved me a lot of time on the job site. And that happens with all different kinds of tools when you learn more about them. I know we've all had moments like that where we've realized, I wish I would have known that sooner. Or we've said, I would have been so much more effective if I would have known this thing did that. Or life would have been much more enjoyable and meaningful had I known that sooner. Amen. We've all been there. And I bring this up because I think many of us will have that same kind of reaction if we truly understood the topic of serving in the church with our spiritual gifting. Amen. Serving in the church with our spiritual gifting. We may have heard that spiritual gifts are a thing, but we don't totally understand what they are or what they're for. We might have the desire to be effective in ministry, but we just don't know where to start. Or we think serving in the church is reserved for super Christians or those leaders when we're actually missing out on the joy and blessing that comes when God works through your gifting and serving. So last week we talked about a crisis in our community and the significant need that that entailed. And this week we're gonna talk about another significant need. And while it's not a crisis in the same way, it is a dire circumstance that if not resolved, will deeply impact our church and the community around us. So today, I have one biblical truth that we're gonna unpack using this passage that we're about to read, as well as a few others that we'll reference. And then I have an invitation for everyone listening in today that I know, based on God's word, will help you to be more spiritually effective, will give you more purpose in your life, and will ultimately lead to your joy and your good. Even if you're already serving with your gifting, I wanna encourage you, don't tune out today. There's still encouragement for you in these verses. And the Lord has used this passage in some helpful and needed ways in my own life this week, and I trust that he can do the same thing for you. And if you're here today and you're exploring Christianity, you've not yet trusted in Jesus, the truths that we're gonna look at today are just as important, I would say even more critical for your life and your eternity. So I wanna invite you to track along with us today as well. So we're gonna be in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse three. Let me give you some context before we read it. This is a passage written by the Apostle Paul to a church he was hoping to visit soon in Rome. And he's writing this letter from the town of Corinth, which today is in south central Greece. Uh, we heard that he had heard that this church had been flourishing in their faith, but at the same time, they were struggling to rightly apply their, the gospel to everyday living. And so in chapter 12, Paul writes to help the members of this church understand some of the characteristics that marks the life of a true Christian. And one of the first things he actually addresses is spiritual gifting. So before we read the passage, I wanna give you a moment just between you and the Lord just to ask him to help you rightly apply this passage well today as well. So let me give you a moment between you, Lord. I'll pray, and then we'll read the passage. Take a moment. Father, we thank you for your inspired and inerrant word. And we ask that you would help us to rightly apply it in our lives today in the ways that you intend for us. We love you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen. 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 This is Romans 12, starting in verse three. We'll read through verse eight, and you'll see the verses on the screen as well. Paul says this. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think with sober judgment 
each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So I want to give you our biblical truth, but before I do that, I do want to recognize that there are some aspects of this topic where Christians often disagree and can. For example, Christians sometimes disagree as to whether certain gifts seen in the New Testament still exist today. And that's not going to be our focus in the message today. As it says in our doctrinal statement, we believe that this is an area where Christians can be in the same church but hold different views. So for today, we're simply just gonna focus on the things that we can all agree on when it comes to spiritual gifting. So here's a statement, and you might consider writing it down. Here's our biblical truth. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit equips every Christian with spiritual gifts for the purpose of building up the local church for the glory of Christ. It's a long sentence, let me read it one more time. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit equips every Christian with spiritual gifts for the purpose of building up the local church for the glory of Christ. And we're gonna unpack that phrase by phrase, starting with the first three words, by God's grace. Because all that we're gonna talk about today is a result of God's grace towards us. Amen. And the word grace simply means undeserved favor or getting what we don't deserve. And this is tied to the core idea of the Bible and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So if you're exploring Christianity here today, this is the reality that God created everything in the world with man and woman being the pinnacle of his creation, which means that he has ultimate authority over all creation as king. Amen. But every single one of us have rejected God. We've rebelled against him by choosing our ways instead of his, which warrants his infinite wrath. Sin against an infinitely holy God leads to eternal separation from him. And the Bible calls our rebellion sin, and it makes us deserving of death, and there's nothing we can do to fix our problem. Amen. That would be bad news if it stopped there, but there's good news for us because when we could do nothing to address our sin, God did everything necessary for us. God came to us in the person of Jesus, and while he had no sin to die for, he lived a perfect life, he willingly died on the cross in our place, taking on the full punishment that we deserved. And then he rose from the dead three days later in victory over sin and death, proclaiming that whoever turns from their sin, no matter who you are or what you've done. If you trust in him, you will be forgiven of your sin and welcomed into a relationship with him that lasts for all eternity. Amen. If you've never received forgiveness of your sin, I want to invite you today to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. This is so important because you cannot save yourself. You can't. That's why Paul starts this passage the way that he does. He says, for by the grace given to me, our good works gain us no good standing before God. In fact, the Bible says that even our best works are like rubbish, literally garbage to God. You need the perfect work of Jesus on your behalf in order to be reconciled to God, and he offers it to you freely. Now, that would have been good news enough for us, but the good news keeps getting better and better. Because when someone comes to faith in Jesus, God comes to live inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works through you in many different ways. Yeah. He helps you to fight sin and temptation. He helps you to grow in likeness to Jesus, which is what all of Romans chapters 1 through 11 are all about. Paul had just talked about this. But then the Holy Spirit also, this is the next phrase in our, in our, our truth, equips every Christian with spiritual gifts. Yeah. The Holy Spirit equips every follower of Jesus with spiritual, meaning spirit-empowered 
gifting. We saw this in verse six of our passage. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Now, to better understand more about what spiritual gifting is, we need to look at some other passages in the Bible. I mentioned earlier that Paul wrote this letter while he was in Corinth, and spiritual gifts were a topic he had to address quite extensively with that church. Here in Romans, he only writes three sentences on spiritual gifting. To the Corinthians, he wrote three full chapters about spiritual gifts. Chapters 12 through 14 are all about spiritual gifting. So I want to invite you to keep your finger in Romans chapter 12 and flip over with me to 1 Corinthians 12. It's the next book in the Bible, just to the right. We'll also have the verses on the screen if you want. But listen to what Paul says at the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians about spiritual gifting. 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 4, he says... Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Listen to this. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. If David were up here preaching, he would be circling those things in that verse, like the same Spirit, same God, manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I'm pretty sure he has the spiritual gifting of preaching with an Apple pencil. I'm (laughs) convinced of it. I don't have that gift. (laughs) Paul's saying here that God sovereignly distributes spiritual gifts to every follower of Jesus as he so desires. So hear me, brother, sister. If you are a follower of Jesus, God has uniquely gifted you with at least one spiritual gift. And these are not talents or skills necessarily, but spirit-powered abilities to minister to others. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. And those gifts will be different from person to person. No one has all of the gifts. No one does. And God does this intentionally to remind us that we need each other. We need each other. While we might have abilities in some areas, we're certainly lacking some in many others. And we need others to come around us to fill in those gaps. It's God's way of reminding us that we are mutually dependent on others in the local church. Mutually dependent. And this is why nearly every passage in the Bible that talks about spiritual gifting uses the imagery of a body. Of a body. Many people tend to view the church on Sunday as a crowd, but the Bible describes us as a body. As a body. Flip back with me to Romans 12. We're gonna go back and forth a lot. Romans 12, starting in verse four, he says, for as in one body, we have many members. And the members do not have all the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So just as your body is made up of a variety of different systems that work together to keep you healthy. Like think of your skeletal system, your muscular system, your nervous system, your vascular system. God has also designed the church to be filled with different giftings to work together to keep his body spiritually healthy. This is the beauty of the church. It's a wonderful reality that only comes by his grace. And it's so amazing when you're part of seeing God at work in and through you. Like for me, I can't begin to describe to you the joy that I feel and experience when the Lord uses me to help someone else understand the Bible a little bit more. We're sitting down across the table and talking through scripture. Because that's not something I can do. Growing an understanding of scripture is a supernatural activity. And I'm just a vessel that God uses to accomplish that work. It's a joy when the Lord works in and through you. But if we're not careful, when it comes to gifting, we can start to focus on that in some unhelpful ways that Paul addresses. Let me mention just a couple of those. First, we can tend to elevate certain people because of their gifting. Tend to elevate people because of their gifting. We're tempted to assign higher value and worth to some people based on their gifts while diminishing others. And that leads to division and arrogance in the church. And God clearly tells us in this passage that this is not right. That's why Paul starts where he does in verse three. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think with sober judgment. Flip back with me to 1 Corinthians because this is what was happening in the Corinthian church. They were seeing certain people and certain giftings as more important and desirable, and Paul tells them very clearly, this is not good. You have to stop. Look at verse 21 through 23 in 1 Corinthians 12. It says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow that greater honor. Why does God design it this way? Jump down to verse 25. God does it this way so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members might have the same, say it with me, care. The same care for one another. Which means that every single believer in the local church, every single member is needed and necessary for the flourishing of that body. From the preacher to the preschool worker to the parking lot volunteer. They are all equally needed and all of equal value. Yes, there might be differing levels of responsibility and authority, but when it comes to function, every single person is needed and necessary. No one's more important than the other. We're all equally made in the image of God. We're all sinners equally in need of his grace, and none of us did anything to deserve the gifts that he's given to us. They're all a result of God's grace. So we can elevate certain people, and we can also become overly concerned about identifying the gifts. We become overly concerned about identifying the gifts. Now, some of you are, were hoping that I would give you the full list of spiritual gifts that we see in the Bible here today. But the reality is, is I can't, actually. Every time spiritual gifting is talked about in the New Testament, the lists are different. We see in the passage we read today, there's seven gifts that Paul talks about here in Romans 12. He'll list many more in 1 Corinthians 12. And then when Peter talks about this in his letter, he only mentions two. <laughs> which seems to imply that the listing of the gifts in the New Testament are more meant to be illustrative than exhaustive. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek to know what the Bible classifies as a spiritual gift. That's why deeper study of these passages is important. Now, hopefully, you're writing some of these down so you can go and look at that a little bit later this week. But what it does mean is that God's main concern, more than knowing the gifts, is that we are faithfully using our gifts to serve others. That we're faithfully using them. And that's why verses six through eight are worded this way. This section seems oddly repetitive at first, but he's using this repetition to make a point. So look back at verse six in Romans 12. It says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Couldn't be more clear. Other translations will say, each of us are to use them accordingly or properly. And then he goes on to make what should be an obvious point. He says, if you're gifted to teach, then teach. If you're gifted to exhort, then exhort, which means offering encouragement or warning others about sin. If you're gifted in extending mercy, extend mercy. You have a gift, so let's use it. Which naturally then leads to the question, how then do I discern my gifting? How do I know what my spiritual gifts are? Which is a really good question to ask. Scores of books and resources have been written on this topic. People will often recommend, just take a spiritual gifts test or assessment. You know, answer these questions and the test will tell you what your gifts are. And while assessments and personality profiles can be helpful in understanding how God has wired and designed you, God actually provides us with some more reliable ways. Especially because if we're honest, we all know how to manipulate those tests, right? Yeah, we do, we do. You know, deep down, you're, you're thinking, man, I really want that gift of teaching. I really want that to be my gift. And you look through that test and it says, people grow from my teaching. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, yes. We know how to manipulate stuff like that. So let me give you two recommendations on how to discern your gifting based on what we see in Scripture. First recommendation, just start serving somewhere. Just start serving somewhere. Pick a place and start. And I say that, this is actually really interesting, is that when you look at many of the spiritual gifts that are listed in the Bible, as you start to identify them, you begin to notice that most of those gifts 
are actually commanded of all Christians at various times and places. They're things we should all be doing anyway. You see that in the list that Paul gives here in Romans. For example, all believers are called to serve others. Galatians 5, 13, but through love, serve one another. All believers are called in some form to teach others, specifically in how we grow in godliness. In fact, the word that Paul uses in this phrase or in this passage for teach is the same word that Jesus uses in the Great Commission. We make disciples by teaching them to observe. There you go, all that I have commanded you. All believers are called to be generous, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, to exhort one another, Hebrews 3, 13, and to extend mercy to others, Luke 6, 36. I could go on and on and on. But as we serve others based on God's word, he will begin to make clear which areas he's especially gifted you. So just start somewhere. Look around the church and ask yourself, where do I see a need? Or maybe ask, where are the needs? And then look into ways that you can actually help that meet, meet that need. And even if it ends up not being the right place, God will absolutely use that experience to help you identify where you are gifted and lead you to that right place. Which then leads to my next recommendation. Secondly, ask others in the church. Ask other believers in the church. Listen to this, your spiritual gifting serves as evidence that God has saved you and placed his spirit inside of you. And as you serve, others in the church will see evidence of your salvation through your gifting. This is actually why it's so important for us that we go out of our way to affirm God's grace in others as we see it. Like, listen to how Paul does this. He affirms God's grace in the believers in the church in Thessalonica. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. But 1 Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 2, Paul says this about this church. We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. How do they know? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Paul's encouraging this church by pointing out the spiritual fruit that's evident in their lives. And not only is that encouraging when we hear that, when someone encourages us that they see God's grace in us, but that actually helps us discern where we might be gifted. And so I would encourage you, maybe I would encourage you to do this sometime this week. Ask the believers in the church who know you best this question. Where do you see the most spiritual fruit in my life? I challenge you to do that sometime this week. Ask, some, ask a few people, where do you see the most spiritual fruit in my life? And their answers will be extremely helpful to you in that discernment process. And because your gifting is based on God's grace and not your talents or abilities, you might be surprised at how the Lord has actually gifted you. You know, one of my favorite examples of this actually comes from one of my church group members. Her name is Shelly, and I've known Shelly for many years. And early on, she was pretty vocal about how much she hated being around people. <laughs> like, she was an introvert to the, the max and did everything she could to avoid being around others. But as she grew in her faith, she understood that as a follower of Jesus, she was called to serve. And so even though begrudgingly, she started to serve in our church family, specifically with our young adult ministry. And as she started serving, she started to notice that people kept coming to her for counseling and care during hard times. And at first she was like, get away from me. <laughs> but they just kept coming. And she was shocked to see how the Lord was actually bringing fruit from those conversations. People were feeling comforted and being pointed back to Jesus. And get this, she was starting to enjoy it. <laughs> shocked her. And so she then started serving as a Stevens minister where people will come alongside others walking through difficult seasons. And then a few years ago, she actually went through our Equip to Counsel training program, and now she serves as a lay counselor in our church, offering care and support to those in need, and she's getting her master's in counseling. Like, only God can do that. 
I tell you, if Kelly or Shelly were standing next to me here on this stage today, she would tell you that never in a million years would she have guessed that this is how the Lord would want her to serve his church. But God has chosen to glorify himself through her in this way. And as we discern our gifting, we then serve while keeping the goal of our serving in mind. And this leads us to the last part of our truth statement. So by God's grace, the Holy Spirit every, equips every Christian with spiritual gifts for the purpose of building up the local church for the glory of Christ. You need, I need you to hear me in this. Your spiritual gifting is not given to you for your benefit. It's not for you. The purpose of your spiritual gifting is to build up others in the church. Amen. This is clear from the passage that we read earlier in 1 Corinthians. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, verse seven. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Paul reiterate this again in chapter 14 where he says, chapter 14, verse 12, so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. And when every member of a local church is serving others faithfully with their gifting, this puts the glory of God on display. Amen. Needs are met, people are encouraged, and as a result, the church grows to look more and more like Jesus. Amen. I love how Paul paints this picture actually in Ephesians 4. I told you we're gonna be all over the place a little bit today. But I'm gonna read a passage from Ephesians 4. It'll be up on the screen. And I want you to look for the number of times he highlights the importance of every member and what that results in. So he, in setting up this passage after highlighting how God gifts the church with various leaders, he says that the purpose of their gifting is, starting in verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, and what's the end result? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What an amazing picture, right? Right? Do you want to experience greater unity in the church? Yes. Do you want to grow in the knowledge and understanding of God and who he is? Yes. Do you want to be able to stand firm in your faith in the midst of a chaotic and confused culture? Yes. Then God says, serve in the church. Serve in the church. This is what he promises to do when each part is working properly. The body will build itself up in love as you serve with the gifting God has equipped you with. And the point of that is not that we glorify ourselves in doing that. It's not to say, look how great we are. Nor is it actually to glorify the gifts. That's not the point either. The point is to glorify God, Amen. the one who made us, the one who saved us and has empowered us to live and serve in these ways. Yes. Listen to how Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 4. He says, as each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And here's the point. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That's the goal, glorifying God. Now, we can think about it this way. Let's go back to the construction example I mentioned a little bit earlier. Imagine looking at a beautiful, newly constructed home. Think about maybe something you saw on HGTV earlier this week or something like that. Beautiful new home. It would be insane if we looked at that house and we stood back and said, man, that's some amazing adhesive gun that they used to build that house. <laughs> or, man, that must have been one awesome hammer they used to put those nails in. One incredible circular saw they used to cut those beams so perfectly straight. That'd be ridiculous, right? Wouldn't glorify the tools. What would, we, what would we give glory to or what would we celebrate? 
the one who designed and built the house. That's the purpose of our gifting, ladies and gentlemen, to glorify the builder of this house, the builder of this body, the Lord Jesus Christ. It puts him on display. And our gifts are merely just tools or instruments to bring him glory in that, just tools. This is important for us in the church, but it's not just important for us, it's also important for those outside of the church as well, those who don't know Jesus. Because when they see people who have nothing else in common except their faith in Jesus, loving, serving, and caring for each other in this way, it puts the glory of God on display to them and invites them to come know and enjoy and exalt him as well. They see that and say, I wanna know the one who built that house. I wanna know that God. So to summarize, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit equips every Christian with spiritual gifts for the purpose of building up the local church for the glory of Christ. Now, I know we've only scratched the surface when it comes to this topic, but this is why it's important that we understand this biblical truth. When we do, we become way more effective in ministry. We experience more of the life that God intends for us to live. We find deeper meaning and purpose, and it brings incredible joy and delight when you see the Spirit of God work in and through it. It's a better way to live, and it's exactly what God has designed you for. Now, with this truth in mind, I do want to pause and recognize that many of you in our church family are and have been serving faithfully within our church. Some of you for many years, some of you for decades. And I want to say to each of you, uh, we personally wanna say that we thank God for you and we constantly see the fruit that the Lord is bringing from your service. We see, I see in here every week how church groups, members in church groups are serving and caring for each other in meaningful ways. We see church members who are serving and investing in the next generation through Kids Quest, Rock, and Access, or a variety of other ministries as well. In fact, our staff took some extended time this past week to share stories from all the different camps and retreats that took place over the summer, and it's clear, God is clearly working in and through you as many children and students decided to place their trust in Jesus this summer. Like Wherever you're serving, you know firsthand the joy that comes from serving with your gifting, and you've seen how it's actually grown your walk with the Lord, too. And the best part is that he promises to continue to do that through your serving. So to you, I wanna read this one verse. It's one of my favorite verses because it shows us that not only does God see your work, but he doesn't forget it. Hebrews 6.10, for God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. God sees your work and he promises not to forget it. So if you're serving, I want you to know that God is honored through your service and we are grateful for you. We're grateful for you. And to those of you who consider NBC to be your church family, particularly if you're a member of NBC and you're not serving in some form or fashion right now, I want you to know that we also thank God for you too. We're so glad to have you here and it is a joy to serve you every single week. But God has you here in this body for a reason. You're needed and necessary, and for your good and God's glory in our church and in our city, we invite you today to start using your gifts to build up this body. This is what it means to be a body. This is why in our membership orientation, actually, one of the pictures of church commitment we talk about, specifically related to biblical fellowship, involves serving with your gifts. I'm gonna read this. This comes right from orientation. We say, we make this statement. We serve one another in church-wide ministries, encouraging one another, caring for one another, bearing with one another, praying for one another, lamenting with one another, sharing each other's joys, and carrying each other's burdens. This is part of what being a member of a church looks like, a commitment to serve others in the church. And if you're here and you've not yet become a member, we invite you to become a member Our next orientation is coming up a little bit later this month, and we'll be offering them every month going forward. We'd love to have you become a committed member of our church family and to start serving with your gifting. 
But even as I say that, I know some of the hesitations that are likely coming to your mind at this point. You might say, well, Nate, I, I just don't know where to serve. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up. I wanna show this to you. This is our ministry directory. We put it out every single quarter, and this is one of the best places you can go to find out most of all the many things that are happening here at our church family. You'll find uh, upcoming events. You'll see a listing of all of our pastors here, how you can get connected to a church group. And then on page 17, you actually will see a listing of all the different ways that you can serve within our church family. In fact, uh, the address is up on the screen. You can pull up a digital version of that right now. We've got copies of this available in the, um, at our Welcome Center. We also even have printouts all throughout the room of that section starting on page 17, so you can even look at those listings right now. There are so many ways that you can serve within our church family, and it can look different. I want to invite you to reach out to one of those opportunities. I'll give you specific instructions in a moment. Also, mark it down on Sunday, September 15th. Yes, we have a church family meeting that evening. And then before and after every service, we are going to have an opportunity fair out in the lobby where you'll be able to talk to representatives from all of those different ministry areas to ask them, what does it look like to serve in this way? They can answer those questions and help you take next steps. So this, I encourage you to grab a copy of this before you leave. You might also say, well, I don't have any experience and I just don't feel equipped to serve. Well, don't forget what we just saw in God's word together. If you are a Christian, you have the spirit of God inside you and he's given you everything you need to fulfill his divine purpose for your life in the church. He's given you all that you need. Just start somewhere. And even again, if it's not the right place, our teams will help you get to the right spot. You don't have to have any prior experience. In fact, I heard the story last week about Edwin, who now serves regularly with our access ministry. Edwin, many months ago, came back to our church. He was in a time being away from the Lord and wanted to reconnect uh, with God, and he happened to sit in this service next to two of our volunteers that serve with access ministry. And during the greeting time, he got, they got to know each other, and then those two volunteers, after the service, made a point to continue that uh, conversation, that connection, and they invited Edwin to come and serve with them in access so Edwin said, sure. And he started serving with our friendship club regularly on Sundays, having no prior experience serving those with special needs. And according to our access team, he has flourished from the start. From the very beginning, he's been a huge encouragement to our access students. He's been incredibly enc encouraging to all of our access families. And he has grown in his faith as a result as well. You don't have to have any experience. God gives you everything you need. You might say, I don't have time to serve. But here's the thing. There are many ways that don't actually require a weekly commitment to serve in our church. There's ways that you can serve while you're already here on a Sunday, particularly with our usher and greeter team, which has great needs right now. You can serve while you're here. Or if you're already in a church group, there's ways that you can serve within your church group to make sure needs are being met in that community, in that group setting. You might also say, well, I have a family with kids, Nate, I can't serve. To which we say, what better way to train up your children in the knowledge and instruction of the Lord by modeling for them and even involving in them while you serve? It's a great way to invest in our children. This is why we encourage parents to bring your children with you to service, and then as you put them into programming, serve during that next hour. Finally, you might also say, well, in a church this large, I'm sure someone else will do it. Someone else is gonna take care of it. Which totally misses the point of what we've just seen in God's word. Every single member is needed and necessary. God's word has made that crystal clear. And in Romans 12, he cautions us against the pride that says, I'm above serving others. He cautions us against that. Well, you know, in preparing for this message, I actually reached out to all of the directors of our major departments here at Tyson's, and I said, send me the number of people that you would need just as a baseline to meet the minimum requirement this fall. I'm not talking like what our dream list would be, but just to do the basic things we need to do this fall, tell me how many people you would need. So each of those departments sent me their number, and I totaled up that number, and do you know what that number was? 503. 503. 
This is why I said at the beginning that there is a dire need in our church. There are major gaps. There are areas of the church, particularly in our children's ministry, where we are having to turn people away because we don't have enough people to serve families in our church. There's other aspects where we're having to delay care to individuals because of a shortage of hands, which means that we here at Tyson's need to respond. We need to take responsibility for this. So here's what I want you to do. We're gonna put a QR code up on the screen. I wanna invite every single one of you to pull out your phone, take a picture of that. You can also go to mclanebible.org slash serving. It'll get you to the same place. And that's gonna take you to a simple form. And on that form, let me just walk you through it real quick. There'll be a place just to enter your basic contact information. And then you'll see a list of all of our different ministry areas here at Tyson's. And I wanna invite you that if you consider Tyson's to be your church home and you're not currently serving anywhere, I wanna encourage you to check just one of those areas. No more than three if you wanna choose more, but just check one of those areas. It's not gonna commit you to serving in that area. If you check that, one of our team members is gonna follow up with you in the week, next week or so and talk to you a little bit about what serving in that area would look like. And if it's not the right answer, they can help answer questions or direct you to another place. There's even an option down there that says, help me, I have no idea. <laughs> we'll help you with that. It's not committing you to serve, this is just an exploratory step. And our goal this fall will be to pray that the Lord raises up at least 503 people to help us build up this local body. Not just because we have major needs, mind you. I want you to hear my heart in this because this is an opportunity for over 503 of you to grow in the Lord and experience him working in your life. You don't want to miss out on that. I, as one of your pastors, do not want you to miss out on that this year, to miss out on the joy the Lord has for you in serving. And if you're already serving somewhere in the church. Again, we thank God for you. We're so grateful to partner with you in serving our church family. I want you to prayerfully consider if the Lord might be leading you to serve in an even greater service function this fall. Or consider who can you bring along with you to serve, whether it's that someone in your family or someone that you're discipling, investing in. How can you help them grow by helping them use their gifting? And then finally, If you're not a follower of Jesus, here's what I want you to know, is that God loves you. He wants to forgive you of your sin, and he can start working in and through your life in this way as well, if you place your trust in him. Place your trust in him and get to be blown away about how God's spirit works in and through you. Consider trusting him during this time. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you a little bit of time just on your own to Go over that form on that page, even if you're already serving. If you haven't, at all the communion tables around the room, you'll see a printout of those ways to serve within our church family. And I just wanna give you some space to wrestle and process and pray through this question. What does faithfulness and serving with my gifting look like this fall? What does that look like? What step do I need to take? And then maybe use this time to fill out that form You can even go to NBC Connect after our service and even ask some questions there or go to the Welcome Center. It'll get you plugged in right away. But let's take some time to intentionally seek the Lord's leading and how he wants us to faithfully apply this text in our lives this fall in this local body. Go ahead and take a moment on your own and I'll come back and uh, help us prepare to take the Lord's Supper.
you're still thinking and praying and looking over some of those things, don't let me interrupt you, but I do want to take a moment and just pray for us. So Heavenly Father, we confess how wicked and prideful and self-centered our hearts can be. We see ourselves as better than others and we often neglect serving you in the way that you've gifted us and in the way that you deserve. God, we're so grateful that you have saved us as your children. We don't deserve your love and your grace and we certainly don't deserve your gifting to work in and through us. And so God, would you help us to faithfully serve you, not out of guilt or compulsion, but out of a worshipful response of the overflowing grace that you've given us in our lives. We thank you that you choose to use broken sinners like us to build up your body. And we pray, Lord, that this fall, specifically here at Tyson's, you would raise up more and more people to understand their gifting and to serve in ways that build up this church family that puts your glory on display. We don't want that attention. We want you to have that attention, God. And so would you lead more than 503 people to serve in ways using their gifts this fall that puts your glory on display. And as a result, meet those needs among us, give us encouragement and strength where we need it, and lead others in our city and even others around the world to see the wonderful builder of this house and give them a desire and a willingness to follow you as well. Use our gifts towards that end, Lord. We love you. We thank you for gifting us as your children. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's children said together, amen. amen.